Okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Tuesday evening Bible study. We thank you for allowing all of us to be able to meet together on Zoom, just to see each other's faces and just to be in your presence through your word. We thank you. We thank you for just being with us um, and watching over all of our Evergreen Church members. Wherever they may be, I pray that your guiding hand will be upon them and that the fiery walls of the Holy Spirit will surround us and protect and guide us. God, I pray that you will boost our immune system so that we could be healthy. And I pray that you will watch over every family, their workplaces, their businesses. And please be with our church. And even though we cannot gather at church, as we gather to worship you online, may you open our hearts and may the Holy Spirit visit each and every one of us and touch us with your word so that our faith may not dwindle, but may, we, may our faith always grow and may we be gifted with the wings of the eagle so that we could always be flying on high spiritually, that when all this is over, that we may come back to meet each other at church with even more strengthened faith in our hearts. Please be with us throughout this Bible study and I pray that it will be your lips preaching this message to us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Um, last time we did a little bit of a, a review and we ended um, talking about how the false prophets like Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx, what their philosophies were about. Um, Marx, who basically... Um, his philosophy became communism and socialism. Um, it, his philosophy begins with the denial of God and he denies the fallen nature of mankind, but he also denies the soul, the, the spirit of man. There is no spiritual world. His philosophy is called materialism because it's all about matter. Okay? And basically he boils the human essence down to what they make, what they produce, their work. And then Nietzsche, you know, he's the guy who said, or who didn't say this, but his philosophy basically is about the fact that might is right, strength, you know, power. So for him, being weak is the worst evil, you know. And um, so I gave that example of a lion killing, you know, a gazelle and eating it. That's not evil, right, in the animal kingdom. So he's saying it's the same thing for humans. If you have the strength, the power to take, take. Do whatever you want, right? And then Freud basically said that human beings are all driven by their basic instincts, you know, the most basic lusts and instincts and desires. Um, and that the Bible says that is the description of a person who is like an animal, right? Who's like a beast, right? Um, in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says he talked about the unreasoning animal. And the word for unreasoning there was a logos right a logos what is logos that that's that means word right and a means without or no or without right so a person without the word of god is basically like a beast in um, the bible so today we're going to delve deeper into this um thing about the beasts uh, we're going to study about the two beasts Throughout this Bible study, I've been talking about how we are already living in the era of the beast. And the beastly worldview is already dominating this world. Okay? So we need to get to know our enemies better. right? So if you look in Revelation chapter 13, the two beasts first come up here. Okay? The first beast is from the sea and then the second beast is from the earth okay so who or what are these beasts okay we need to know their identity so we know how to prepare to fight against them and when i say fight against them you know this is not a physical fight right you have to understand that remember this is a, a spiritual struggle Right? That's what Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says. 
Okay, let's look at that verse. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Right? This is what Paul clearly said already 2,000 years ago. He said, our struggle is a spiritual struggle. So the beasts that we need to identify, they are uh, the, the battle against them is a spiritual battle. But it's not that the beasts are spiritual beings. Um, so we're going to get to know what they are today, okay? So let's get started. Who are these beasts? If you look in Revelation chapter 13, um, verse 1 clearly starts with the dragon, right? It says, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Why was he standing there? If you go back to the last verse, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it says, So the dragon was enraged with a woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So let me just give you the background here. Who's the woman? The woman here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, is the woman clothed with the sun. And this woman clothed with the sun is the true church of the end times. And she is the church that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And so the dragon wanted to kill her and persecute her, but God gave her two wings of eagles and made her take refuge in the wilderness, in her own place. So the dragon was enraged. So what does he do now? The dragon comes to earth to make war with the rest of her children children of the woman clothed with the sun. So these are the saints, the individual true saints of the end times. Okay, So that's why the dragon was standing on the sand of the seashore, getting ready to fight against the true children, the children of the woman clothed with the sun. And that's when the beast comes out of the sea. Okay, And then... So if you go down to verse 2, the second part of verse 2, the last sentence of verse 2 says, And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So the dragon gives his power and authority to the beast that comes up out of the sea. Okay. So in order to understand the beast from the sea, we have to understand who the dragon is first. Okay, so to do that, let's go back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So this verse describes who the dragon is. So who's the dragon? The dragon is the serpent of old, dragon is the devil, and the Satan. All three of those. So this is sort of like the Trinity for God, right? God is a triune God. God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's sort of like that because the dragon is Satan, devil, certain, serpent. This is all part of the dragon. They're all the same being. So the serpent who made Adam fall in the Garden of Eden is the same uh, dragon, and it is the same devil who tested Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew and Luke, right? And this dragon is described, look at verse 3 here. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, right? So this dragon is described as the red dragon, right? Okay. So who is this dragon? Okay, first of all, uh, we have to understand that dragon is a spiritual being. So uh, in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon persecutes the woman, right? So this is a, a spiritual being. In other words, they cannot be seen visible with our own eyes. Okay. 
But then in Revelation 13, the dragon no longer does all this dirty work himself. He gives the power to the beasts. Beasts are actual beings, right? They're not just spiritual beings. Okay? So there is a there's this shift here between Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13. Okay? In Revelation 12, the dragon as a spiritual being, he was in the background persecuting the church. But now in Revelation 13, there's a shift. He gives his power to the beasts who are actual living physical beings on earth. And they receive power, and now they do the persecuting and the fighting against the saints. Okay? So, I could describe it like this. Within the great seven-year tribulation, remember right at the middle, this is the first three and a half years, and then the latter three and a half years, and right at the middle, um, worship is banned right and there's no more word so this latter three and a half years is is a much tougher harder tribulation right so we could think of it like this revelation 12 is the first three and a half years there is tribulation but it's a spiritual tribulation the dragon is not seen is in the background once the beasts come on the being uh, on the scene, that is the second, the latter three and a half years. Now their persecution is actual; it's physical, and it's really happening in history. You could see it, all right. So the dragon is now giving power to the beasts so that they could do his dirty work. And why is this dragon called the red dragon? Why the color red? Why do you think? We have to understand this. Okay? To understand this, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 25, verse 30. Okay? Genesis chapter 25, verse 30. This is the, the story of Jacob and Esau, right? Verse 30 says, Then Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there. For I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Remember the story? Okay. Esau came home hungry from hunting. Jacob was making lentil stew. And Esau says, let me have some of that red stuff. He calls it the red stuff. There's a reason why the Bible would record it exactly like that, using the word red here, right? There's a meaning behind that. Okay. And then Jacob says, okay, sell me your birthright. And look at verse 32. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? So Jacob said, swear to me. So he swore, sold him the birthright. And Esau received that red stuff, the lentil stew. Okay. So we have to think of this from two different perspectives from Jacob's perspective and also from Esau's perspective. From Jacob's perspective, I think we learned this. I think I've taught this before. From Jacob's perspective, this red stuff foreshadows the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? This birthright that Adam lost when he fell, right? In the Garden of Eden, Adam was the firstborn of God, right? But he fell and lost that birthright to the serpent because he fell and he obeyed the words of the serpent, right? So what did Jesus do? Jesus came back to redeem that birthright, and he did it by shedding his blood. He paid his own blood to purchase us back from slavery, from sin and death, right? So Jacob here buying back the birthright using this red stuff is a foreshadowing of the work that Jesus would do for us on the cross. But think of it from Esau's perspective. It's a little bit different. From Esau's perspective, he already has the birthright, but he's like, 
It doesn't mean anything to me. This birthright is meaningless. Because this birthright is a spiritual blessing, right? The birthright here is a spiritual blessing. Of course, the spiritual blessing that God gives eventually will turn into material and physical blessings as well, right? So if we receive the spiritual blessing from God, we will then receive blessing of health and wealth as well, okay? But first and foremost, this is a spiritual blessing. And for Esau, that was meaningless to him. He didn't care for it. So he sold that to get what? This red stuff. Okay, this red stuff. So for Esau, what is this red stuff? This is material, materialistic blessings. That's why his nickname became Edom. Because the Hebrew word for red is Adom. Okay, so from there we get the word Edom. They both mean the same thing, red. Okay, so this is the beginning of this red worldview, I'm going to call it. Okay, this is the beginning. And what is this red worldview? It's a materialistic worldview. That's, that was Esau's worldview, right? What was his worldview? His worldview was spiritual blessing that's meaningless. Ah, I don't need that. I need stuff. That's what red worldview is, right? I need stuff. I need, you know, this. I need my iPad. I need my computer. I need, whoops. I need my, you know, money, car, those things. So I will sell my spiritual blessings if I have to, to get those stuff. That's the red worldview. And from, from Esau on, we get this kind of, you know, line of worldview that is being passed on to the people that are opposed to God, right? Whereas Jacob is the other side. He would rather give up stuff in order to get the spiritual blessings, right? So we need to be like Jacob. We need to prioritize our spiritual blessing over and above all of our other blessings. Because once the spiritual blessing comes, then God, from there on, God gives us other things that we need. Okay. So this red worldview is why the dragon is called the red dragon. That red worldview, which... You're not going to find it. I just made that up, okay? That terminology. But that's the worldview that the dragon is pushing. And he's going to use that worldview. The beast is going to use that worldview to deceive people. Okay? So the word red there is referring back to Edom, okay? Which also means red. Okay? So the worldview of the dragon is red meaning it's materialistic. Where do we find this materialistic worldview? That's Marx, right? His worldview is called the dialectical materialism, which you guys don't have to know this, but see, that world is there, materialism. It's all about material. His worldview is all about economy. It's about money. It's, you know, he says history is all about the haves and the have-nots fighting it out, right? It's, it has nothing to do with spiritual world. So that's the dragon. That dragon has been persecuting the church in the background. But now that dragon gives power to the beast and enables the beast to now come up and do its fighting for him. Okay, so now we have to go and learn about the beasts. The one from the sea and another from the earth. In the Bible, the sea 
represents the secular world. Okay, and let me give you two verses to explain that. First is James chapter 1, verse 6, and then Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. So let's look at James chapter 1, verse 6. It says, But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. So the sea here, the surf of the sea, is likened to the person who doubts. Because the surf of the sea, what happens? The waves go back and forth. They're driven and tossed by the wind. It's not steady, right? It just goes back and forth, back and forth. So that describes a doubting heart. So in other words, the sea, sea symbolizes the faithless world. So senior pastor, uh, Reverend Abraham Park, put it like this. The sea here uh, symbolizes the atheistic, secular uh, kingdom. So this is a more of a political power. Okay. Let's also look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 15. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, right? So the waters, the sea where the harlot was sitting on, that sea is the people, multitude, nations and tongues, right? These are the nations. These are the secular kingdoms, the atheistic kingdoms, okay? And then the earth then is, the earth is, a place where you could stand on, right? It's firm ground and you could plant seeds or, you know, on it and it'll grow, right? So this is the opposite of the sea. So this is a world of faith. But here, right now, this is the fallen earth, right? That's where the beast comes up from, right? So what does this earth symbolize? This is the religious philosophical and ideological realm. That's hard to understand, right? What does that mean? So the earth is like the religious world and the philosophical world. So if the sea was the political world, that's where the kings and presidents and generals and you know those guys work in the sea. But the thinkers, the academy, like schools, colleges, that's all part of this world. This is a world of ideas and religion and beliefs. So how do we explain the relationship between the beast from the earth and the beast from the sea? Okay. If you look in Revelation 13, the beast from the earth deceives people on earth. And what is he want the people on earth to do he deceives the people on earth and makes them worship the beast from the sea okay so beast from the sea it needs to be worshiped so the beast from earth it deceives the people to to worship this beast okay so in other words the thinkers the the, the philosophers they come up with ideas theories teachings that and that deceives the people to make them worship the beast from the sea so for example Marx's ideas enabled countries like Soviet Union, China, and North Korea to exist, right? 
So these will be like the, the beast from the sea, and this he would be like the beast from the earth. As an example, you know, Nietzsche, his idea was taken up by Hitler. And it was the basis for Nazi Germany. Right? Nietzsche's ideas were used to justify what Nazi Germany did. Okay. So that's sort of that sort of kind of explains the relationship between the beast from the earth to the beast from the sea. And if you look at the description of the beast from the sea, let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 2. It says, And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was the, like, was the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, right? So this beast was sort of like a leopard, bear, and lion. Okay? Where do we get these kinds of animals? Well, if you look in Daniel chapter 7, we get four beasts, okay? Let's look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. So Daniel 7, 3 says, And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, right? Same thing, from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. And then the second, verse 5, second resembling a bear, right? Oops, bear here. And then the third looked like a leopard. And then the fourth one was just a dreadful beast with iron teeth. Okay. So who are these four beasts in Daniel 7? Well, I mean, we don't have time to go through explaining. I'll just give you the answer. The order was different, right? It was lion, bear, leopard, and beast with iron teeth so in daniel these four were the kingdoms of babylon medo persia no so or just persia and then greece and rome okay why these four kingdoms? Was because these four kingdoms were the kingdoms that were that had ruled the whole world. That they were the most powerful kingdoms at the time. Babylon was ruling the world, right? And then Persia took over. They were after that. And then Greece took over after that. And then Rome took over after that. And Rome was really brutal, right? It was described as the beast with iron teeth. And during Rome, the Roman Empire, that's when Jesus died on the cross. So this beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation is basically a, a sort of like a descendant of all of these kingdoms. Okay? And they it had the characteristics of all four of them. Okay? All it had the characteristics of all four of them. It's basically a, a continuation. So this is a description of the kingdoms of the world. And then the beast from the earth will deceive the people to worship it. So the beast from the earth is basically the false prophet. Okay. So let's look at Revelation chapter 13 verse 12. So this is talking about the beast from the earth, right? The beast from the earth exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those dwell, who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Okay. The one thing about the first beast, the beast from the sea, it looked like it had died and then it came back to life. That's why the people were amazed by it. They were like, wow, I thought it was dead. And then he came back to life. And then the beast from the earth says, look at that. That's why that beast 
is worthy to be worshipped, right? So that beast from the earth is basically the false prophet. Look at this first sentence here. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, right? Now let's look at Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast was seized. This is talking about the beast from the sea. And with him the false prophet who performed signs in his presence. Remember, we just read that the beast from the earth performed signs in the presence of the beast from the sea, right? And here it says the beast from the sea was seized with him, the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. So the, the beast from the earth here is now referred to as the false prophet. Okay. So now we have the identities, right? So beast from sea are the, the nations that oppose God. And then the beast from the earth is the false prophets who deceives the people to worship this beast here. Okay. And then the thing that they do is the beast from the earth gives people the mark of the beast. Which is 666, six, six, right? And everybody on earth who does not have the seal of God on their foreheads will receive this mark. There have been all kinds of theories about this mark, right? That it's the barcode, that it's the, the symbol for the Pope, that, you know, that it's, uh, if you add up the numbers, like in Hebrew and Greek, each letter of the alphabet is assigned a number. So if you add up the number for Nero, the Roman Empire, it comes out to 666 or something like that. There's all kinds of theories like that, okay? And, you know, there, I think, you guys probably don't know this. There was a movie called, you know, Damien, or was it called Omen or something? Of this little child that's born when they shaved his head, he had the mark 666 on his head. So there have been all kinds of theories about this, but we know that, that those things are all wrong, right? So what does 666 mean? Okay. The number six is the number of the fall, right? It's the number of fallen man. Because Adam was created on the sixth day. And he fell on the sixth day. God wanted him to reach the seventh day Sabbath rest, but he never got there. Okay. And seven is the number of completion and perfection, right? And he fell just before that. So six is the number of the fall. It's the number of incompleteness, right? And so it's the number of the fallen man, right? So why 666? Because the Bible teaches us that man is composed of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Okay, so let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Here it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So here it talks about, may your soul, spirit, and body, these three parts, that's your entire being, may it be preserved uh, when Christ comes. Right? So human beings are uh, composed of these three parts, spirit, soul, and body. So 666 basically is saying that all three parts are fallen. So 666 is talking about complete fallenness. So 600 symbolizes the spirit. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, it says that the spirit of man is the lamp of God, right? The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of his being, okay? So the spirit of man is like the lamp 
where you would pour in the oil and where it holds the wick that if you light it, it would get lit as long as there's oil in it. Okay. So the oil is the spirit of God. The lamp itself, the vessel is the spirit of man. So man is the only being. Beasts don't have this spirit. Man is the only being that has this spirit, which is the vessel to hold the spirit of God. So when God pours his oil, the spirit of God in us, the light could come on, right? And we could shine as the light of this world. So that's why the man is such a special being. We're the only ones who have the vessel to receive the spirit of God in us. But if the spirit is broken, then we cannot receive God's spirit, right? So the spirit of man is the faculty that enables us to acknowledge God. That recognizes God. Oops. So if our spirit is dead, then we cannot recognize God, right? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So the word here, a natural man, if you look at this right here, if you look at, there's a little one there, right? That footnote, what does it say? Or an unspiritual man. That's literally what this word means. So an unspiritual man cannot accept the Spirit of God because it sounds like foolishness to them, right? That's a person whose spirit is dead. So the spirit of God cannot come into them. The spirit of man is the contact, the point of contact between man and God. If that spirit is dead, then there is no point of contact with God. That means they cannot recognize God. They cannot recognize or acknowledge the spiritual world. Okay. So the 600 symbolizes the fallen spirit. It means that their spirit is dead. And then the 60 is, is corresponds to the soul. So what's the dif difference between spirit and soul? In, in the Bible, sometimes spirit and soul are uh, together, are expressed as soul, or sometimes they're split up and expressed as spirit and soul separately. Okay? So here, where it's a soul, it's talking about our intellect, emotion, and will the soul is comprised of these three things intellect emotion and will okay and then the six will be you know flesh or body so the soul is what moves us drives us it's what we think what we feel and how we decide things this is the important part so originally God created us so that the spirit of God would come into our spirit, spirit and that spirit would rule over the soul and that soul would move the body to do God's will. That's how we were originally created. But when Adam fell, the opposite happened. The body to control over the soul and used it to do its will. And what is the body's will? Those are what's called instincts, desires, and lusts. Okay? So the body is now in control over the soul. If the spirit dies, there is no opposition to the body. There's nothing that will fight against the body. And then the soul is basically under the control of the fleshly things like this. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 17. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. 
for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please, right? So what are they fighting over? They're fighting over control over the soul, the spirit and the flesh. But if your spirit is dead, there is no opposition. The flesh has taken full control. And so that's who are, are the ones, those are the ones who receive the mark of the beast. So right now, as Galatians 5.17 says, that there is a, a battle going on within us right now between the spirit and the body. And if that battle is going on, that's good. It's supposed to be like that. And hopefully that battle will be won by the spirit of God in you. Okay? Then we are the ones who will receive the seal of God upon our foreheads. But if the flesh wins that battle, then you will receive the mark of the beast the spirit will die and you will be under control of the beast. Where is that mark of the beast given? In Revelation 13, uh, 16, it says, And he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So the mark of the beast is given either on forehead or right hand. Whereas the seal of God is given only on the forehead. So what's the difference? The forehead symbolizes our thought and our beliefs. So God seals us through his word to change our thought and our belief system. The mark, uh, the beast also tries to do the same thing. He tries to brainwash us to change our thought and our beliefs. But the beast also does one more. It seals on the right hand. Hand symbolizes our actions. Okay? So he forces our hand. Whereas God does not. God gives us freedom of choice. God is the only one who gives us free will. Think about this. In the Garden of Eden, what did God say? Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? So many people complain about this. If you look at the Ten Commandments, it's mostly do not, do not, do not, do not murder, do not steal, etc., etc., right? So many people complain about why is God so you know, prohibitive. He's always so restricting, right? And they complain about this. Well, what did the serpent do? Serpent says, do eat, eat it. So the serpent was positive, right? Do this. But you guys must understand what this means, the implication behind this. The serpent is force, forcing the hand of Adam, whereas God is not. Okay, let me explain why that is. When God says do not, he's basically making a little boundary around us for our safety. Don't go outside of this boundary. But everything inside you could do freely, right? That's what he said, literally. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. See that? God gave Adam the choice to eat from whatever tree there was, except for one. Verse 17 says, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat because you're going to die. That's for Adam's protection. So God gave them free choice from, to eat from any tree in the garden, except for that one tree. Okay. So God is not prohibitive. He's actually giving him a lot of free choice. But what did, uh, uh, what did the serpent do? Serpent says, eat that tree. You must eat that tree. So when God says, do not eat, the implication behind that is you can eat everything else. See, there's more freedom here. But when the serpent says, do eat this, the implication be behind that is you cannot eat anything else. 
So God gave us freedom of choice. The serpent didn't. And that is shown where the mark of the beast is given. The beast gives its mark on the right hand. Just as the serpent forced the hand of Adam to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the beast right now also wants to force our hand to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil once again so that we will receive his, uh, his mark. Okay? The only thing that gives us true freedom is the word of God, the word of Jesus Christ, right? And he said his word, the truth, will set us free. So we must remember this. Don't fall for the lie that says that God is prohibitive, that he is always denying things for, from us. It's not like that. He gave us the choice to do what we want. But he gave us these boundaries, these fences to protect us from what's dangerous to us. So basically, the world that we're living in right now is being ruled over by this beastly worldview. And that beastly worldview is described as 666. That's what it is. The mark of the beast is if you accept the beastly worldview and believe in it, then you have already received the mark of the beast. But if you receive the word of God, then you have received the seal of God. So we need to receive the seal of God upon our foreheads. That's the only thing that will protect us and prevent us from getting the mark of the beast. So, in conclusion, how can we become man in the image of God and not beasts in the end times? Remember when in Genesis, when God created the universe on the sixth day, what did he create? He created man in the image of God and he also created beasts. And what's interesting is that in Revelation, these two are the very beings that are fighting against each other. It's, it's a battle between man in the image of God, the saints against the beast. So the sixth day of creation actually foreshadowed this already in Genesis chapter 1. Okay. So Genesis chapter 1 is all about separating, right? Separating light and darkness, separating the waters above and the waters below, separating land and sea, separating the sun from the moon and the stars, separating the birds in the air from the fish in the sea, and finally separating man from beast. So that work is going on right now. The separation between man and from beast. So we need to, when this separation happens, we need to be on the part where we are the man in the image of God and not the beast, right? So how do we do that? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 verses 29 through 30. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 says then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. So this is the, at the end of the sixth day when God created man and beast. He assigned the foods that they're going to eat. He said to man in verse 29, I have given you every plant yielding seed and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. Those are going to be your foods. And for the beasts, I have given you the green plant. Every green plant you could eat. Now think about that. Do all beasts eat only green plants? Don't lions and other carnivores eat meat? Some people read this verse and say, well, before the fall, all animals were vegetarian. I don't know how valid that is, but we need to understand this a little bit differently. Man was given food. The food that he was given was plants yielding seed, trees 
yielding fruits that have seed. Whereas beasts were only given green plants. The word for green plants here is yerek. And the food that was given to man, the main point you can see is the seed here. Seed. Okay, so let's look at Luke chapter 8 verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, right? So the seed is the word of God. Whereas the green plants, Yerek, what is this? Well, in the Bible, this word is used to describe fallen, mortal human beings. So the Bible says in places like Psalms or in 1 Kings, it says, all fallen human beings are like the green plants that fade away. Okay? So... Fallen human beings, they're eventually going to die and fade away. They're gone, like the green plants. Okay. And then another time that this word is used is when King Ahab wanted to steal his neighbor Naboth's vineyard. And he wanted to take this vineyard and make it into a vegetable garden. Vineyard symbolizes church, right? Because Jesus is the vine. But he wanted to take that and turn it into a vegetable garden. A garden without seed. The, vegetable, the word for vegetable here is yerek. These are green plants without seed. Without the word of God. So yerek then basically symbolizes human tradition human teachings. So, beasts are the beings that only feed on human tradition and human teachings. Whereas man in the image of God feed upon the word of God. Okay? So basically, if you only take in what you are taught at school, those are human teachings and human traditions, then you're going to become a beast, spiritually speaking. But man shall live by every word that comes from the mouth of God, right? That is the true man in the image of God. Okay? Those are Jesus' words. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. So Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. See? So that's the difference. If you live on the word of God, you are man in the image of God. If you live on human traditions, humanistic teachings, then you will eventually become a beast and you will be ruled over, over by beastly worldviews. No matter you know, how smart you are, how intelligent you may be, that doesn't matter. Because all of that is food for beasts only. And this happened on the sixth day, right? This is a foreshadowing. Already in Genesis, God already saw what was going to happen in the end times. And he wrote that in there, predicting what's going to happen, right? So if you look in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, this is what it says. Do not let this one fact escape your notice. See, God's emphasizing this. This is so important. He says, don't escape, don't let this escape your notice, right? Beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. So for God, one day equals what? One thousand years. So the sixth day would be what? Six thousand years, right? Right now, remember Adam was created in 4114 BC. And we are in the year 2020 AD. 
So if you add this together, what that's what, 6,134 years? God predicted that on the sixth day, there will be a separation between man and beast, right? So in other words, that's going on right now in our lifetime. We're living through that. Are we going to be man in the image of God or are we going to be beast? The only way we could become man in the image of God is, is if we live on the word of God. We must feed on the word of God. That must be our primary meal. Okay? I'm not telling you to just quit everything and just go read the Bible in the mountains every single day of your life. If you could do that, that'd be great, but we can't. Of course, you have to go to school, you go to college, and you will come into contact with these beastly worldviews. But first and foremost, you must be armed with the Word of God, and you must feed yourself the Word of God every day so that you could overcome those things. You could overcome the beastly worldview so that you will not be marked with the mark of the beast, so that you could receive the image of God. Okay. Let's just read one last verse and we'll end. Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. So I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. So here it says the people who have overcome, who have been victorious over the beast and his number has also overcome his image, it says, right? His image. So the mark of the beast gives you the mark of the beast, 666. If you accept that, that gives you the image of the beast. But continual feeding upon the word of God will give you the image of God. Okay. So in the end, it's all about, are you going to be man in the image of God? Or are you going to be man in the image of beast? Which one is it going to be? And the answer is simple. If you feed on the word of God continually, then we will be man in the image of God. If not, everything else is the image of the beast. So I pray that all of us will continually feed on the word of God so that we could take on the image of our Lord Jesus Christ and overcome the image and the number of the beast. I pray this blessing upon all of you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for the word that you have given to us. Help us to just not just learn this word as knowledge, but help us to take this to heart and live this out in our lives by feeding upon your word daily and constantly so that we could overcome the beastly worldview that is dominating the world right now. Please seal our hearts and our minds with your word so that we will not fall uh, and be deceived by the lies of the beast that the world is feeding everyone right now. But may we receive God's word daily so that we could overcome and be victorious. We thank you so much for your grace and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.